Good evening, everyone. Um, today, we are discussing is our speaker uh, about uh, megafauna in coastal closer uh, We are the founding member of uh, the region, and we are doing researching on coastal. He is currently a PhD student in the University of Germany. So he is going to share us uh, this information. So I will read Martin. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, just to kind of let everyone know what you just say. My name is Martin. I'm the founder of the Olive Bridging Project. It's a UK based charity with the aim of uh, taking a look at the impact of ghost gear and also promoting the conservation of sea turtles. In the ocean, over here, it's going to be to speak for about an hour or so, so I'll try not to keep too much of your time. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about uh, the effect of ghost gear and tumbling on megafauna. Um, the, all this information can be found on, uh, I'll actually share it with you guys, and I'll share it with you guys, and then you guys can give it uh, to everybody in the room. It was a paper that was published early this year, and it's a, a global assessment of marine uh, megafauna and ghost gear and tumbling. Uh, so all the information that I'm going to give you today uh, will be in this um, paper. And I'm more than happy to share that with you if you'd like to have that. Okay, so just to make sure that we're all on the same kind of level, uh, what is ghost gear? Well, ghost gear is any abandoned, lost or discarded fishing gear. Uh, it, can come in, it can come in many different forms. It can come in the form of nets. It can also come in the form of fads, which are fish aggregating devices, which float on the surface and collect lots of fish. And it can also come in the form of uh, also come in the form of traps and pots. There's many different forms that fishing gear uh, can come in the form of ghost gear. Now, what causes ghost gear? There's many different reasons. Fishermen can just by accident lose nets, but more often than not, uh, they're lost during uh, during operational uh, procedures. So, as the fishermen are using their nets and they're on the reef, they get snagged on rocks, they get snagged on wrecks, or whatever it is on the bottom, and they lose fragments of pieces of nets in that way. There's also a slightly sinister way of losing nets, uh, especially when there's conflict between gear, uh, gill netters and trawlers, sometimes that is also uh, the case. Now nets can be found, or ghost gear can be found anywhere in the water column. It can also be found on beaches as well, so you can find it completely submerged, just under the surface, on the surface, or also on the beaches. So what is megafauna? Well, literally translated, mega is large, fauna is animal. So we're talking about large animals. Uh, mainly the marine mammals, which include the seals, the sea lions, uh, dugongs, manatees, whales, and dolphins. They're what I'm going to be focusing on in this review. Marine reptiles, uh, mainly in this review, we're going to be talking about saltwater crocodiles, uh, and also sea turtles. And the last branch, which of course includes uh, the uh, sharks, skates, and rays. So why am I focusing on megafauna? It's a pretty good question because obviously there's lots of other species that are certainly affected by ghost gear, particularly fish and all sorts of crustaceans. Well, there's a few reasons. Um, megafauna are classed as a case-selected life strategy, which basically means, um, sorry, when compared that to something like fish or crustaceans that have an R-selected uh, strategy. Now, a case selected strategy or lifestyle have fewer offspring, low fecundity, but that's what we refer it to. And generally speaking, their offspring do survive to an older age because there's some sort of parental guidance or care. Very different to an R selected life strategy such as fish, which generally spawn and there's no parental guidance or care after spawning. Um, they also have a long life expectancy, something like a sea turtle can live for maybe 20, uh, for 75, 80 plus years, similar with whales, even hundreds of years in some instances, compared up to crustaceans and fish, which have a very, very short lifespan in comparison. Uh, they also have a, a lower rate, um, a higher age of sexual maturity. Again, good example is a sea turtle, 25 plus years to be sexually mature, where you compare that to a fish, which is a lot shorter, it could be a few months, or at most a couple of years. So this is why we're focusing on megafauna, because they are really sensitive to uh, anthropogenic threats. Their populations are extremely sensitive. Now globally, we're facing a bit of a crisis. How do we feed 9 billion people on the planet that is estimated to be on this planet by 2050? Currently, we have around 7.4 uh, billion people on the planet. 
And it's estimated that around 31% of the world's fish stocks are uh, biologically overfished. Uh, so basically, we're fishing at a rate and they're not being replaced in time. So that's kind of what that means. And that's 31% of the total fish stocks. 93.4 uh, million uh, tons of tuna are caught globally every year, and there's an estimated 4.3, uh, 4.6 million ton, uh, million um, mechanized boats that are currently catching all sorts of fish species in practice today. Now these numbers are quite staggering, but we do have to remember that these are numbers that are registered uh, vessels, and also the numbers that have been registered to the FAO. Of course, there's lots of illegal fishing that is going on, and these figures do not represent this number. So, of course, when there's global fishing pressure, there's also an increase in the amount of fishing gear that is being, that, that is being used. Now, fishers, because they're really competing against each other to catch smaller and smaller fish stocks, they're trying to go out into further reaches of the ocean. They're also using gear which lasts, lasts a lo uh, much longer, such as synthetics like plastics. And of course, when this gear is lost, it takes a very long time for this gear to buy the way. In fact, every piece of plastic that's ever been made in the planet still exists today. And this is the problem with ghost gear. So what is the problem with ghost gear? Well, the problem with ghost gear is ghost fishing. Ghost fishing is the continuing trapping killing of marine organisms after all control of that fishing gear has been lost. Um, now, there are studies out there that kind of give indications of ghost fishing rates, but generally speaking, trying to work out ghost fishing rates is extremely difficult because most observations rely on stranding observations or observations out at sea, which of course are obviously very, uh, are quite few and far between. Now, ghost fishing rates do vary depending on uh, a few factors. It depends on the environmental conditions, such as the currents, the winds, storms, things like this. It also depends on what habitat that the ghost gear is interacting with. And it also depends on the abundance of marine life in the areas that the ghost gear is interacting with. There is research out there to suggest that ghost fishing efficiency decreases over time. So when a net is lost over, let's say, three months, it will reduce down to, let's say, about 20%. But then after about 27 months, it will drop all the way down to about 5 or 6% of its original fishing capacity. After that amount of time, it can almost reduce down to zero. But this much uh, greatly depends on whereabouts the ghost gear is. For instance, this ghost gear here was just found as a crumpled pile on the seabed. Of course, something like this is going to be quite an old net hasn't really got much efficiency in terms of ghost fishing because there isn't much structure left to the net. However, if you have a look at this net here, it's draped over a coral feature, so the net structure is intact. So all this mesh that you see is exposed for crustaceans and small fish to get entangled. So of course, the difference between ghost fishing efficiency between this and this one is very different. This is going to be much higher. Um, traps and pots are said to have a ghost fishing capacity at a greater rate uh, than fishing nets because if you look at the fishing trap, they have a very rigid structure. Uh, it's very difficult for them to kind of change their structure over time when you compare it to a fishing net. So when anything goes into the trap, they can't escape. So if this gear is lost, of course it's going to continue to ghost fish for a very long time. Now, ghost gear that is open in the open ocean is said to have this cyclic, uh, there's evidence to suggest has this kind of like cyclic kind of uh, uh, lifespan. Basically, ghost gear will start. Sorry, ghost gear will start its life uh, kind of uh, on the fishing boat here. A fishing boat will lose the net, or uh, during operational, it, it, it pieces of net are lost. If they are lost on the coral reef, then the, the net will be snagged on the coral reef, and then of course it will smother corals. It will interfere with all types of reef fish. But over time, a lot of fishing gear is able to float because it's less dense than seawater especially the plastic, the polypropylene, that kind of material, it floats on the sea surface. As it floats, it continues to ghost fish. So it catches lots of sharks, it catches lots of whales, lots of turtles, and also lots of fish. Now, of course, as the ghost fishing capacity increases, the weight of the net, the net increases, and the net starts to sink. Now, during periods of bad weather, storms, the net, the net obviously starts to move in the water, which can shape out a lot of the, the, the bioaccumulation on the net, but also the ghost fishing uh, creatures that are in there as well. And also there's lots of benthic communities that will feed on whatever is inside that, that, uh, that ghost net. Of course, once the ghost 
fishing uh, animals have removed and also the bioaccumulation has reduced. The next starts to uh, decrease the dead ceiling and, and rises to the surface. So it has this whole cycle of, of, uh, of the ghost fishing. And of course, the lifespan of plastic is very long, so this can happen to go on for decades until, of course, humans intervene and remove that net from the ocean. So the paper that I was talking to before, what we did to kind of analyze globally the effect of entanglement of ghost gear on metaphorna is we use Google Scholar and Science Direct search engines, and we use these key, key words here uh, to find out the, the impact of, of ghost gear entanglement on these animals. Now, the last comprehensive review of ghost gear entanglement was in 1997, quite a long time ago. So we're reviewing from 1997 to 2015. So the information you see from now on is between uh, that date. Surprisingly, despite the fact that the last review was in uh, 1997, only 76 papers were, were found. Uh, now, it's very difficult to talk about ghost fishing specifically because a lot of uh, papers and literature was talking about ghost gear but also general marine debris and we're very careful not to, uh, to kind of group those two marine debris issues together because management for ghost fishing and management for let's say debris coming from cruise lines is very different. So we have to be very careful, we were made very clear on what was included in our review and what was not included in our review. Also, species that were, uh, could be identified through scarring, so things like dolphins and whales. When you take a picture of a dolphin or a whale, if you have a look at the tail, there's lots of uh, scars. This is a good indication that there's been some interaction with some fishing here. If the author could not identify it, we included that in our review as well. In total, we found 50 different species, which consisted of 27 marine mammals, 7 reptiles, and 6 Alaskan rams. We identified 12 new species in addition to what was identified in 1997. I do stress that this is only information that is published or in the great literature. I'm also a member of the Global Ghost Gear Initiative, and I have the, uh, the coordinator for the Build Evidence Working Group, so I had the opportunity to speak to the Secretariat to try and get some great literature as well. So we really had a big, broad coverage of, of uh, papers and great literature, and that's what we call Great Literature Review. As soon as we uh, analyze the information, a couple of uh, interesting kind of uh, points started to come across, and, and, and there's a few patterns that we can see, see emerging. Um, first of all, you can probably notice that reptiles here, generally reptiles, and to be honest with you, most of the reptiles that were recorded in the, in the review were sea turtles. Uh, six of the seven species were actually recorded, and I'll talk about that a little bit later on. But this black bar here represents that most of the sea turtles in the literature were associated with ghost nets. Uh, similar to um, um, Alaskan brands, a lot of the Alaskan brands, a lot of the sharks, they were the species that we mainly recorded in our literature that could be found, again were associated with nets and also with pinnipeds, which includes the seals and the, um, uh, the sea lions, which are also associated with nets. Monofilament 9, which is this kind of vertical line here, these ones here. You notice that that was the second most recorded type of gear that was interactive with megafauna that we could find. Um, cetaceans, uh, because of their size, obviously a lot of the rope that we were finding were associated with traps and pots. Traps and pots, of course, do not really interact with megafauna because of their sheer size. However, the lead lines and the lines that lead from the uh, traps to the surface, whales and dolphins can pass through that and obviously become entangled uh, in that way. Of course, there was quite a lot of gear that we could not identify uh, because a lot of recordings of whales and dolphins relied on photographic evidence of scarring. So although we know that there was interaction with some fishery at some point, we can't be sure what type of material was causing the scars. Now, there were some bias in the results. Um, geographical bias, uh, certainly. In the Atlantic and the Pacific, this is generally where a lot of, most of the information came from. Um, places like the Indian Ocean, such as where we are right now, the southern and the Arctic, have very little information. This is where we need to start thinking about improving our, our evidence on ghost fishing and ghost gear in these regions. So what did we find? Well, uh, marine mammals and ghost fishing, we found that all groups of marine mammals were affected by ghost fishing to some degree. Um, for marine mammals, the humpback whale and the North Atlantic great right whale accounted for 24% of all the marine animals that we actually recorded. So a large portion were just in those two species. 
Now, the danger with the North Atlantic right whale is there's very few. There's about 526 of them left, as estimated as of 2015. So there's very, very few. So we really have to be careful and, and, and really have to have a lot more evidence on the effects of ghost fishing and ghost gear, but particularly on the North Atlantic right whale. And you'll notice that a lot of the ghost gear is kind of interacting with, uh, on, for the whales and the dolphins on the tail of the peduncle here. And this is uh, a way that, as scientists, we can identify if a whale or a dolphin has been interacting with, with ghost gear. Because if it has, it notices lots of stars. Some of the authors that we reviewed, uh, actually, one particular one uh, notified 626 species of uh, North Atlantic right whales, and over 83% of those did show some signs of scars. So that's a large portion of the population interacting with some fish reading, also with bycatch. If you have a look at the seals and the pinnipeds, so the pin, uh, seals and the sea lions, sorry, these guys were interacting with fishing gear, mainly around the body, mainly around the neck. Uh, there was very little around the flippers, around the, around the, around the, uh, the flipper area of the main trunk, mainly around the, the neck area here. And again, they were mainly interacting with nets. Now, their curious nature could be a key indicator as to why they were interacting with fishing nets, especially amongst the juveniles. Manatees, we didn't really have much uh, literature out there, there isn't much literature out there, on the effect of ghost fishing on manatees. But what we do know is those uh, manatees really do have a problem with monofilament line. Now manatees, if you're not aware, interact with both freshwater and also saltwater environments, exactly where recreational fishers are also present. So of course, where there's recreational fishers, there's also lost fishing line. And this is where we find lots of interactions with manatees and monofilament net. We can't say for sure that monofilament net is the sole type of ghost gear that is endangering the manatee, because we've got very little data to suggest that, but there is evidence to give an indication that that could be the case. Now, marine reptiles, and this is kind of uh, relevant for, for the Maldi, that this is uh, a lot of the work that I'm doing at the moment. Now, of all the literature that I could find out there, uh, six of the seven species of sea turtles were interacting with ghost gear to some degree. 68% uh, of the turtles were olive ridges as well. There's a few reasons why we think it may be the olive ridges. Um, now, ghost gear is a problem for sea turtles because it interacts with three main, three main uh, habitats. It interacts with nesting beaches because there's lots of ghost gear on beaches. Um, it interacts with <coughs> their coral feeding areas, so really shallow areas, and it interacts with the open ocean where there's hatchlings and where there's species like the leatherback and also the olive ridge. And so it really does interact with every single type of habitat that the sea turtle can be found in. Um, now there are some studies to suggest that adults were more uh, susceptible to ghost fishing than juveniles. And there was a, a theory that the reason for this is because juveniles were too were small, they were able to escape the net. However, in Maldives, our studies would actually contradict that because most of the, most of the olive rivers that we find in our area are actually uh, juveniles and sub So the main reason for that is we're not actually quite sure and we're in the process of trying to find that out as we speak. Um, now the reason we think it could be the olive rivers, particularly in this area, is because it tends to be oceanic and it also occupies the rhytic zone, so close to shore as well. It feeds on a whole array of marine organisms from crabs, jellyfish, mollusks, all sorts of things. Uh, so it really does interact with two different habitats, including the nesting beach, which is the third habitat, where you can find this ghost gear. Something like the hawks will agree in the Maldives tends to stick to the, to the reefs, uh, where we're not finding that much ghost gear at the moment. Now, what are the Alaska branks? Um, Alaska branks and ghost fishing, there's very, very little information uh, on the effect that ghost, ghost gear is having on Alaska branks. We could only find around six species of sharks and one species of ray that were affected by ghost fishing. This doesn't mean that they are not affected, it just means that there's not enough information out there or enough studies to give us any indication on the effect that it's having at the population level. Um, there are certain species, like the short, um, like the uh, small tooth rostrum of the of a sawtooth fish, a uh, sawtooth shark, sorry. Um, because of its shape, its elongated rostrum, it's estimated that a lot of the, uh, the population is in critical decline because they're caught in bycatch, wrapping up in their nets. So the IUCN actually listed this as critically endangered. Um, this is a good indicator that ghost gear could be followed the same line for this particular species. 
There's also the issue with silky sharks in the Indian Ocean, particularly with fish aggregating devices, which are operating in the Western Indian Ocean. Um, the IOTC have recognized that, unfortunately, uh, lost fishing gear such as fads are undermining the conservation measures that are currently in place because a lot of the fads are also catching silky sharks as well. Again, there's no studies right now to kind of give an idea of how ghost fishing is affecting this population, so we're in urgent need uh, for this to happen. So what management and mitigation measures can we take? There's two types of uh, measures that we can take. We can take curative measures and we can take preventative measures. Of course, prevention is always better than cure. And we talk, in terms of curative, what these uh, devices are here, these are called grapples. And grapples can be used and towed behind boats. Uh, so if a fisherman suspects there's lots of fishing gear at the seabed, and they tow this material behind them, this gear behind them, and it snags on the fishing gear, and it can recover the fishing gear in that way. However, there's no clear evidence to suggest that it's able to recover full fishing nets. What likely happens is, as it's moving through the water, it takes pieces of the net and not necessarily the whole net in one go. So yeah, there are caveats by using uh, this type of gear, but there are advantages also. We also need to understand the topography of the, of the bottom and also the kind of marine habitat that you're dealing with. You can't just go ahead and start using these if you're not sure what is happening down there. You can damage your gear, you can also damage lots of habitats as well. And of course, under the curative measures, you can also have divers. This is generally used in kind of close near shore environments where depths do not really exceed much than 40 meters. Of course, again, there's caveats with this. Divers are only uh, limited to time, they're also limited by weather, they can go out and collect the gear. Um, but it can be very effective for cleaning up places like wrecks, cleaning up local reefs, and there's lots of programs out there that are currently using this method uh, and cleaning up lots of fishing gear that is out there at the moment. Now, with preventative measures for ghost gear, there are a few measures that we can take. One important measure that, uh, that we highlighted and hasn't been proven to be effective is the need for education amongst fishing communities. Uh, the need for education amongst fishing communities is much needed because a lot of the times fishing communities do not really want to lose their nets because they're very expensive. And they lose a net, it costs them a lot of money, so the last thing they want to do is, is lose gear. What it really boils down to is a, a, a not really a, a kind of connection uh, between the, the effects of them losing gear and where it's going to happen onto the marine environment. So by engaging with the fishing community and letting them understand how it affects their livelihood and how it affects the future fish stocks as well, it really engages them and really tries to prevent the loss of gear. Um, a good example is, there's two good examples. Our Ibrigi projects are working in different areas, but one good example is in Pakistan. We're working with the Ramahanga uh, community. There's around 150 fishing boats, which consists of around 800 fishing uh, individuals within that fishing community. Before, when they were coming to the end of their life of fishing gear, instead of just disposing it correctly, they were just dumping on beaches, sometimes they were also throwing it overboard. We've been working with them for the past year or so, uh, and now they're actually, through the education and through the outreach, they're starting to recover their own gear. So they're walking on really important nesting beaches, green nesting beaches, green turtle nesting beaches, and also gear that is no longer being used, they're starting to recover that, and they're collecting it, and they're giving it to us, and we're starting to reuse that gear in things like art installations, we can use it in construction, and a whole other array of different, uh, different uh, ways. Uh, these guys have collected in total 30 bags, which is about two or three truckloads of, of gear, completely off their own back. They haven't talked to it, they've just done it. So it's been a really effective way, and proof that education really does work. A really good example is Ghost Nets Australia working in uh, and the Gulf of Carpentaria, which is north there. Um, they've been working on the effects of ghost gear for a very long time, around 10 years. In that time, they've recovered about over, over 5,000 ghost nets, a, a lot of ghost nets. They've been working with indigenous uh, Aboriginal people in Australia, and they've been basing their kind of relationship on a level of trust. So they've been working with them really closely, they've been educating them, uh, they've been kind of constantly they patrol the beaches and start recovering their gear, recovering their gear. And this isn't paid work, they're doing it because they understand the implications of lost gear on the marine environment. So another good indication that education is, 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 a, is a preventative measure that could potentially work. Now, one of the biggest problems with ghost gear is understanding where it's coming from. A lot of the time, ghost gear is able to move. 
this here is an ocean model. And basically what it's showing you, you have the Maldives here, India, Sri Lanka. As we all know, Maldives is subject to two major monsoons. You have the northeast monsoon where currents come from this direction, from the Indian direction. And then we have the southwest monsoon where currents come from here and moving this way. So of course, if fishing gear is lost over here, what's going to happen is the ghost gear is going to travel down the east coast, under the south coast of Sri Lanka and migrate into the Maldives. Similarly, during the southwest monsoon over in Somalia and up in Oman, when gear is lost, it's going to slowly migrate into the Maldives. Unfortunately, the Maldives is lying north-south across the east-west kind of current, so anything floating through the debris is trapped by the islands of the Maldives. It is a unique opportunity because it offers the opportunity to find out where this gear is coming from. But it's very difficult because just because the gear has got markings on them, particularly with their boys and with their uh, man -made, uh, sort of, uh, artisanal boys like bottles and things like this, doesn't necessarily mean it's come from that country uh, because sometimes fishing gear can be improvised. But there are a few ways that we can work this out. We can use drone technology, which can be used locally and regionally. And drone technology has its limitations, of course. It's only uh, possible to use a drone within a certain radius, maybe two miles. It also, although it can detect gear, it can't remove gear. Uh, but you can also attach sensors, different sensors to drones, which can potentially look at temperature. You can also identify conversion zones, uh, conversion zones and eddies because these are accumulation points for, for lots of marine debris. And if scientists understand where these accumu accumulation areas are, we could potentially go out, run expeditions, clean these areas up, but not only that, try and work out where gear is coming from. Ocean models are also very useful. Um, we can use different models to try and identify a potential source. Right now, we're collecting lots of information on the types of gear that we're, we're finding in the Maldives, and we're trying to work on a project with the University of Exeter uh, to create a model so that when we find gear, we can have a timeline and try and trace it back to an original source. If we can trace it back to an original source, we're not, we're not pointing fingers and saying, why are you losing all this gear? It's more for us to know where this gear is coming from so that we can uh, implement and, and push all our resources into these regions. Right now, we're kind of working blind because we don't really know where, we, where this gear is coming from, so we're kind of working all over. So we can fine tune our resources by through this model uh, here, then there's a really good chance of, uh, of helping communities out. Gear marking is also a big topic. Recently, the FAO are right now holding a, a big seminar in Rome on the impact of uh, lost fishing gear, uh, but also a possible prevention, of, which is a possible solution, which is the use of gear marking. So if we can use gear marking, when we find fishing gear, we know that that uh, specific gear is from a, a specific region. It's a very, very useful tool, and it's one that we're working on right now as we speak. It potentially could be very successful in the future. When we assessed um, all the literature in the uh, out there, that's on, you know, online and in the great literature, we noticed that ghost gear and marine debris were kind of grouped together as kind of one entangling hazard, um, which of course gives an entanglement mortality rate for species, but it's very difficult to identify the specifics of ghost fishing and ghost gear on marine species when it's grouped together with lots of other marine debris like plastic bags, uh, the bottle uh, holders, tires, clothing, all this kind of debris which also entangles marine life. Now the reason we need to separate the two, two types of marine debris is because the managerial decisions that are going to be used for ghost fishing are going to be very different from plastic bags or let's say tails or clothing or all the other types of marine debris. So there's an urgent need for future science and future research and when we are looking into the research we need to make a clear distinct distinction between ghost gear and general marine debris. Science is very difficult in science sometimes to collaborate. Sometimes in science, when we have a database and we collect all this information, scientists want to keep their information, they don't want to share it. If we have that mindset, nothing's going to change. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to be in an environment where everybody's keeping hold of all this information and nobody can do anything about it. We notice that there are lots of organizations, NGOs, even governments that are collecting data on ghost fishing, but a lot of the times this information isn't published. So you would be literally spending your, your entire life on the internet looking for all these uh, singular cases of ghost fishing. But collectively, you can make a, a, it's a lot of information that is uh, missing from this review. So there's a urgent need for us to collaborate. 
Uh, we need to start collaborating on the types of ghost gear that's being found. We need to start collaborating on the types of, uh, the types of organisms that are being uh, entangled. And what we recommend is uh, potentially creating regional databases uh, for the Atlantic, Pacific, Indian Ocean, these type of regions, uh, on the types of ghost gears that are being found. But also, uh, regional databases on the types of marine organisms that are being found solely to do with ghost gear, not general marine debris. Because if we're linking general marine debris, as I say, we can't get an idea of ghost fishing and the effect of ghost fishing on populations. So this is really important. Sorry. This is really important and there's an urgent need for collaboration. Thank you for listening. And if anybody has any questions, we're more than happy to answer them for you. Could we, could we require the, the netting and the traps and all that have some kind of simple, like, I don't know, GPS locator or something so that if they're lost, then we'd be able to, be able to detect them? Yes, yeah, so on the traps and pots. Uh, but for the most part, let's say in the map, for instance, all the traps are artisanal traps. So they have no they don't have the resources to buy trackers, which are obviously quite expensive. So they just use visual cues and environmental kind of cues to know where their gear is. But of course, when storms pass through, they lose track of where their gear is. A good idea for we're talking about traps and parts would be potentially having a mechanism where um, over a period of time there's a, an opening, like a, an exit point, and by degrades over time. So if the gear is lost, let's say six months later, there's a huge opening that allows any ghost catch to actually escape. This is one, and certain regions are actually implementing this in Scotland, I believe. In the UK, they're doing a, a project kind of based, sorry, not Scotland, in Wales. They're doing a project that is based on this. Easy for the fishermen to implement. They just cut a little rectangle out of their trap. In. They put this kind of door, this trap door in, and then over, let's say, I think it's a year, or maybe I'm not quite sure on the time scale, but over a certain amount of time, it might be raised, and then obviously anything else trapped in there is able to escape all the time. And then if the gear hasn't been lost, the fisherman just replace uh, the back of that rectangle panel. So it's really effective and it's one that would really work for traps and pots. In terms of trackers, some do, most don't. If you don't have any questions, uh, we thank Swari for the interesting lecture. It was a very interesting research on the ghost uh, So. Uh, we do have refreshments uh, outside the auditorium. Thank you all for coming here. And uh, there's a sign-up sheet, so please fill in the details so that we can keep you updated on the next tenancy. Thank you.